So our first keynote speaker is founder and lead architect at Bernard Mallat Architects. He acquired his undergraduate and graduate uh, uh, education in architecture and design at the University of Maryland in the United States. Mr. Mallat built many projects in our capital, Beirut, and his practices activities include architecture and urban design and more. Please welcome Mr. M Bernard Mallat, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, it's a um, it's a sad moment in our uh, history, and uh, I decided to talk today about uh, what what one can do in a country where every accident, every wrong, every crime, disaster, every challenge is met with incompetence, ineptitude, failure, and near total uselessness of uh, our authorities. So what should we do? According to um, the dictionary, government is necessary to the existence of civilized society. However, in our little world in, in Lebanon, in our wonderful country, the only thing we can count on is that they will not be present. They will not be there to assist us as a people or as architects. So we face a lack of or obsolete uh, infrastructure. We, we design in a vacuum. There's a total breakdown of a system that we're supposed to rely on, upon. And uh, while there are some remnants, I would say, of infrastructure, we're in, we're in a situation where the very thing we count on is unavailable or inefficient. So what are we to do? Now, are we back in the Stone Age? more or less, <laughs> is architecture now unnecessary? We have a financial crisis that's never happened. Uh, I mean, unlike any that has ever happened in the last century. And we should not fool ourselves. Architecture is a service that's typically offered to the richest of the rich in our society. Our clients are often very rich, fortunate people. But, and, and uh, we can and do design for others less fortunate but it's rare, and again, the government role is very minimal. We don't have social housing, we don't have, uh, or, or if there is any social housing, it's uh, led by religious entities. So the dream that's of some architects, which is to design socially responsible projects or public projects, rarely ever materializes in a country like ours, in the Lebanese architect's career. So I, I chose instead to look at a few projects, some that are before the crisis and some post-crisis so that we can compare a little bit how things have to be done. But the ones I chose that are pre-crisis are also relevant in some of their, um, their strategies. And I will start and go very quickly over different things here. This is a, a cluster project. As you may know, we design sometimes uh, restaurants, clusters, restaurants, bars, and, uh, and offices. So this is just before the crisis. We had uh, approached a project that's on the, the shore. And uh, our inspiration, rather than being the beautiful uh, beaches, which I'm not sure Lebanon is, is famous for, it's more this kind of coastline, which is uh, typical, and uh, the site itself was this, the was owned by um, the U.S. Uh, embassy that was supposed to be built on that site, and then they moved to Alcar. So uh, this is why you see a ship there from the U.S. Navy. So uh, when approaching this project, we we looked at um, mechanical systems. You know, uh, when you're doing restaurants and bars and things like that, you have huge loads. And we started looking at exposing the mechanical systems rather than hiding them, which is a strategy that we use and that takes a lot of effort. So we thought, OK, we'll make these towers that expose the water tanks, gas tanks, uh, AC units, et cetera. And these we called the CO2 towers. And we countered them with something that was the oxygen towers, the O2 towers. And those would be green uh, vegetation plants, 
trees. So this was a way to approach um, this project. And if I show you what it is, it's sort of a temple, designed as a temple for food. Now, uh, this thing tried to take all the right notches. I'll show you a little video here where we tried to create, of course, a garden, which is something that uh, the government doesn't provide, right? They don't provide parks. They don't provide places for people to, to uh, get uh, their leisure time. Uh, according to the WHO, a healthy city needs about 20% minimum of a green space, while Beirut has about 2%. So as architects, maybe this is the kind of thing we should do. We should try to make a green project, and I mean green as in greenery, not just uh, sustainable, which we're doing here as well. So most of the spaces are outdoors, utilizing less, uh, less energy and less mechanical uh, systems. We have rainwater recuperation. We, have, um, we try to generate our own, um, our own power with uh, photovoltaic panels and with um, uh, windmills in this case. So wind power, it's next to the, the sea and you've got strong, uh, strong winds. And we try to also create spaces that, again, the government never provides. Uh, you know, you want to take your kid to a, to, to a park and uh, to swings and to have some fun. You can't even find them in Lebanon. You've got to go pay for this. So, of course, in, in this project, there was uh, um, uh, spaces for kids, play areas, etc. And uh, all built, of course, around uh, the experience of eating, which is big in Lebanon. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the central courtyard, with a, which is a park. And um, in essence, uh, what you're gonna see next is some of those towers with the, the windmills and the, the trees, so the O2 towers and the CO2 towers. So this was something we did, obviously, before um, the crisis. And uh, our, our client was obviously in the know and uh, canceled the project quite quickly after, um, uh, actually before the crisis started. He said that Lebanon was going to shit, he knew, and he said this is not going to take place, we're gonna put it on hold, we might do it a little later. Mike? This thing, okay. So, um, I will uh, add the as a counterpoint, now, uh, some of you may have visited the backyard. You may know this project that we, uh, we designed uh, a few years back. And uh, I'm showing this one, again, just a few, a few images that, to talk about strategies that one can use today to, to design in Lebanon. Now, uh, we looked at our social practices, obviously, because, again, the government doesn't provide benches. It doesn't provide uh, public space. It doesn't provide piazzas. People take over the sidewalk, put a few chairs, a table, and and we we sit and play uh, chess or tawli. So we decided in our project to take care of some of these things and built in some benches in the outside perimeter of the project and the facade. And we don't see why all architects could do that. If if every one of us, instead of counting on the government to provide all these things, we create gardens, we create benches in our project, we created. Uh, I don't know, trash cans, everything that they don't do, we can do without resorting to them. So this is an example of something that's outside the project. So it's not designed to, um, for the consumer. It's designed for the passerby, right? It's designed to give back to the city. So two lovers can sit facing each other or somebody walking their dog come, come and rest. Or you have, uh, you know, spontaneous gathering by kids. Um, it's not intended for the consumer. It, itself. Uh, here, this is even designed for little kids to sit because it's, it's got a bench that's lower and then uh, uh, people like the staff uh, of the restaurants come out and on their break and sit there. The idea is to find a way to do things that are never done for us in this place. So uh, another thing that we did in this project is uh, to try to approach the project economic uh, economically, uh, let's say, to try to be sustainable economically. And if we look at urban decay in our city and uh, the walls, the aging quality that Beirut has, 
we're uh, we're sometimes all of us are, are attracted to that. We often go to places like Jamaize, uh, Madam Chayil, and go see these things. Go sit in a in a pub that's under a vault that's hundreds of years old. So we try to capture this quality in a brand new building. So to do that, we tried using textures. We kept the the concrete completely raw, very economical. It doesn't cost anything. It's very textured and it, it, it kind of ages very quickly or has that quality. And um, we took advantage of construction methods. We have uh, steel tie rods, right? When we do form work for, for uh, concrete, we have these tie rods that look like this. They're cut off and plastered over generally. But instead, what we did is we cleaned them up, painted them, and used them uh, as our hairy cladding, if you want. So we, we found ways to design in a, in a condition that is, um, well, I mean, obviously this was before the crisis, but the economics of projects like these, this project is on a rented piece of land that will be returned to their original owners after 17 years. So it's a temporary project, essentially. Maybe the owners will take it and operate it, but it's meant... Not, it's not meant to last a long time, and the investors don't want to spend a lot of money because they want to get their money back. So we had to think of economics. We had to think, how do you not spend so much money and do something interesting? And this is very pertinent, I think, today with our economic conditions. Now, we use the same strategy in the pedestrian bridges here. We, we use, this is a structural bridge. There are two of them in the project. And we're taking waste, which is the... Uh, the rods, the steel rods that are cut off when you, when you build a column, they're too long, so you have leftover pieces that you either throw away or you send back to the factory. They can be melted and made into, into steel again. But, um, you know, we upcycled them instead. We used the, um, the metal rods to, to create a space frame, but it's a randomized space frame. We believe this is the first time it was ever used in the world, I think. But... Uh, this space frame, space, I mean, space frame has a four millimeter steel plate, and this thing structurally works. It was experimental. We we had to load them and test them, and it uh, they respectively carried four and five tons of weight, so it worked perfectly well. The principle was sound, and it's all made out of waste. So this is again a kind of strategy that can be used um, in. Um, in these conditions, in the difficult conditions we're living now. So, oh, I mean, this is some mood shots and the, the greenery that's brought into the project. I will show quickly a, another project that uses the same technique, very small chapel that uh, we hope is going to be built very soon. And it's just made of uh, recycled steel rebar. So this thing is just a four by six space. It's outdoors. It rains inside, but it's, uh, it's just made of rebar, and it, uh, it melds with nature and uh, costs very little. Now, if we look back at a few years ago, some of the projects we designed it should have been built and would have been perfect for now is something like a tower. Now, t a tower, this tower would never be built today. I think it's gonna, we're going to have to wait, wait a few years before any of us architects design a tower. But the concept and the approach was sound. Here, again, we were trying to create a neighborhood, a vertical neighborhood. And so we looked at the uh, village and gardens, and we thought, can we assemble these kinds of things vertically? How can we create a vertical neighborhood? And we managed to you know, think about this, distribute them around the building, and uh, transfer them vertically. And we, we did a little illustration to show what we were thinking. We were thinking of this little village that goes up. Now, our version is contemporary, of course, and uh, this is kind of what it looks like. And these were gardens that are meant to be the public spaces within the building. This stair that is the vertical circulation or, or the vertical, um, let's say, roads, or pa passages, pedestrian passages from, from space to space. It also doubles up as a fire, fire escape. And, and this project tried to use all the techniques that one would, sustainable techniques. Of course, in a few years, maybe we'll be able to go back to this kind of thing. Now, uh, here we're pixelating 
the neighborhood, in a sense, into a facade that utilizes sustainable techniques. Now we have PV panels, we have CPC panels, which are water heating elements, we have wood panels for shading, we have gardens, so everything is distributed randomly across the facade and uh, fulfill the needs of the project. If we look at it, we had greenery throughout the building, anywhere, on any floor, you, you were kind of surrounded by greenery, if possible. You had gardens that you could exist within. And yeah, some people may not like the facade or like it, but it's, uh, it was uh, purposeful. This is a southern facade that we're looking at. We created a park which people could use. Obviously, in this case, it probably would be private to the, or the, the, the people in the building. But what I can tell you is, even though we, we had all the tick, tick marks of a lead building, let's say, one thing we did here is, uh, with a lot of uh, 1,973 square meters, we managed to, to come back after building 20,000 square meters and have over 2,600 meters of green. So had we made it into a park, we would have less greenery than we had after building 20,000 square meters. Something that, uh, of course, I mean, it's not real deep soil and, and extremely large trees, but it's pretty substantial. And I think this is the kind of thing that the OEA could push for, for the build, on the building code in order to get, uh, um, it, could, it could mandate that any building has to bring 100% of greenery back, 100% of the lot area be green. So, and it can be done. We prove it here. We prove that we could do even more. So we hope that these kinds of ideas can eventually uh, transpire into real projects in the future. However, uh, the Aina Ramene project is a same kind of residential building, but it's small scale. This is more likely the kind of thing will, that will happen in the near future. So this thing is a, I mean, sits in a low to middle income neighborhood, chaotic, messy, it has its own identity. And we thought, okay, if we give them some kind of uh, simple building, they're going to start doing different things, right? They're going to, people are going to start hanging their laundry. They're, it's going to be a bit messy. So we thought, let's make it messy from the beginning. Let's look at low-cost solutions. The plumbing, okay, we'll put it on the facade immediately. We'll just start having those, uh, that plumbing directly there, exposed. We'll, uh, people will come in and will start installing their AC units and ruin your facade, right? You designed a nice little white box or something, and then we thought, okay, well, we'll start putting them before they do. Right? We'll anticipate. And let's put them on the facade, connect them to our, uh, our drainage system, We'll put boxes where they can install their units, and maybe we'll mess around with color. So we started playing around, trying to see what we could obtain. Would it be fun? And then uh, identity, graphics. Now, this kind of uh, unit might be on the sixth floor in the living room, so it would, be, it would have some graphic indicating what it is for ease of, uh, of maintenance later, the graphics for the parking, etc. And we looked at the socio... Uh, the social habits that people have. Beirut has, uh, you know, these, these, this sally, this basket that we, people used to use when they didn't want to go down the stair and up the stair. And this is happening again, of course, with no electricity and problems with elevators. So, you know, this, was, we decided to have every apartment have its own little basket, right? And so if you forget your, uh, your wallet or something, you can call up mom or somebody at the house and, and dad, and they can drop that uh, basket with your wallet. So the idea is to look at everything that was around us and what was going on, what goes on in the neighborhood, and see if we can use it. Barrels, people put uh, trees in barrels or in a tanket nido in a, in a little uh, <laughs> metal can, and they put some plant in there, so why don't we just put it in our project? And we integrated them in the facade, put, you know, used recycled barrels, planted them. So you see here the baskets, the barrels, and, uh, you know, probably local plants, parsley, za'atar, <laughs> thyme, this kind of thing. And um, you get a building that's uh, perfectly, in our opinion, perfectly integrated in its neighborhood, and that doesn't cost, doesn't cost much. It's about, it's really about how it responds to needs 
we played, of course, with colors, but in the end, we ended up with a simple black and white building. Um, that's the final, uh, the final renderings for the project. It was more or less this thing. I'll show you a couple of more images. You can see the side facades where the ACs are hanging, the plants, the pipes, etc. So, you know, pretty simple ideas, cheap, economically very feasible, and it doesn't have to be a horrible building because we don't have a budget. That's the idea behind that. And uh, so this is how we think we can scale things. Now, I will show a project that we're designing right now. And this is another cluster of restaurants. And um, we started thinking about the fact that these things are temporary. And we thought the previous ones that we had designed are going to be demolished after a few years. So you're going to have to tear them down. That creates waste. So we thought, why don't we make it truly temporary? And we thought about a scaffolding system. Why not use the scaffolding as a final thing? You know, it's used to build the building, but it can be used and stay there. So if you look at the perspectives, I have much, multiple variations, but I'll show one. You see here uh, the scaffolding, and it holds up these boxes, which are offices, and the, the, the restaurants are down at the bottom, so, or shops, it could be. And therefore, this system is, a, is a, a structure that can be removed after a few years and taken somewhere else, right? It could be moved out of Beirut. It could be put aside for a while and put back somewhere or moved to, I don't know, Batrun. Like right now, today, people in Batrun are uh, doing well for some reason. People are going to the beach and staying there. So, okay, take it, build it there. Anyway, it's, uh, it's a different approach than uh, the previous one we had. So um, we thought it would be more sustainable and it, it would make more sense. Also, it use, utilizes uh, advertising. This is off the highway. It goes, it's the road that goes to, to Sessin, the, the, the highway bridge before you go up to Sassine and, and we thought we could use advertising to um, finance some of the, the services in the project so it could advertise for the project and it could also they could sell advertising to, to people. So this is this little idea. I'm not going to go through any of the other iterations. Um, and uh, another project that used to be expensive and is now changing is this little thing here. We had some retaining walls that were turning into uh, buildings, and uh, they, were, they were chalets uh, on the mountain overlooking the sea, so we had this obviously expensive uh, you know, kind of architecture, funky. We had fun. We designed it, but we realized, okay, today this is not working. We can't do this and the client came back to us and told us okay I want to put some prefabricated units on the site and that's that I can't afford to do uh, to, to spend and build this thing and we're going to do something cheap and we thought okay then we started working with a company that does prefabrication and uh, designed some units and we believe that prefabrication tends to be what, ugly repetitive etc but we tried to do something a little different oops sorry uh, let me go back here so we start with a unit type that's 25 square meters, would be pretty cheap if somebody wants to buy it. Let's say it's $1,000 a square meter, that would be $25,000. So it wouldn't be too bad. A very small uh, unit that has uh, one kitchen, one bathroom, and a little living room with a couch that opens up and becomes a bed. So it's a tiny, kind of a studio apartment, but it's an individual house. So then you could put two of these things together, and you get this, right? This is exactly two units, except that the partitions that were there are gone. And this thing looks, I would say, a little nicer than your typical prefab uh, unit. Uh, integrate nature. We then looked at also variations on these things. This 25 square meter unit has a little upstairs bedroom. Right? There's a little bed up there. You go up and you can overlook the, the space below. It's still tiny. And we looked at making the facade variations. So we have things like uh, this, then we do that, then we do this. It's a loop, it's a different thing. So that if we have to build many of these on the site, they don't have to be identical, they don't have to all be the same. And we thought, okay, so why not also play with color? So if you decide, you know, you, you I don't know, you like Hezbollah, or <laughs> you, you want to have a yellow house, you can have a, a yellow house, you can go with uh, red, uh, you can go with uh, green, you know, it's your choice. 
you can have a little fun with your unit and uh, there'll be variety on the site, whatever color you decide to go with. And of course you can use two of these to make a different kind of house again. So if we go to type four, you can see that these are two units together. So another variation. So these things combine in many different ways and, and start becoming far more interesting than the a single thing, right? So again, this has variety in terms of uh, what it can look like. And uh, you can mess with colors again. So again, um, yellow or red or blue. So this is a loop version or the other version that's in blue. You want it red, you go ahead. So. There's infinite variety in a sense if we recombine these things. We also combine some of the units that are low. The, the, the first unit you saw, if you combine it with this, then now you have a low unit and a high unit. And, and this is, again, a different combination. Again, you can uh, change its color. And uh, there's even a variety where this, this unit um, that's on the right, the one that has a pitch roof, is higher. So you can see here a slightly higher units, which gets a terrace upstairs. You can see that has a terrace. And essentially what we're trying to say is, I suppose the future is going in this direction. We have, you know, we have to use different approaches to architecture in this country, especially with lack of money and the lack of infrastructure and everything that's happening. So we've got to think about outside the box. We've got to adapt and, um, um, uh, uh, excuse me, sorry. Uh, damn. I apologize. Sorry. I was here. That's it. That's my last slide anyway. So <laughs> I was going to suggest that, uh, you know, uh, we can adapt. Perhaps the breakdown of government and infrastructure is helping it accelerate the adoption of some of these positive measures, right? Sustainability. We have to put photovoltaic panels to get power because we can't afford to pay for power anymore because the government doesn't provide power. We have to think about scale. We have to think about reuse. We have to think about prefabrication. All these things are in the cards and perhaps we'll have a healthier future of architecture in our country uh, due to this crisis. So let's not look at all the bad sides only. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll get lucky. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we will be going for a very short break right now. Okay, so we're back with uh, Mr. Malat with questions and answers. Um, so you built so many projects in Beirut. Were any affected uh, by the explosion? I wouldn't say I built so many projects, but I have a few. And uh, yes, most projects that we, we worked on, I mean, there's some, a lot of interiors that were damaged. Um, a lot of people had their apartments demolished, so we... We helped them out to rebuild them. We had a couple of shops that we had done. Those are interior projects that were uh, damaged. We also have a, a project that did many, many, many years ago, right near the port, and that's gone. Uh, it was steel and glass, so there's not much left of it. Um, but uh, well, a lot of people have restored, have been able to restore their uh, their homes, and we helped them out. But um, it's obviously, you know, not the rich people that uh, have a problem. It's the people that don't have the means to, re to repair and restore their homes that have a real problem. Okay, and do you have any future plans concerning these projects or any upcoming projects in the city? Well, I showed one of them, which is the Ashrafi, um, um, this cluster of restaurants and, and uh, offices, right? It was shared offices. but. We don't even know if this is going to be built. Now, the, the client is paying us to continue the design, but it's entirely possible that they will stay. Let's put it on hold for a little bit and wait till uh, things get better. So we, we don't know. I mean, we have other projects outside Beirut, but those are private projects, like um, 
a landscape or a villa or a villa or things like that. Those were building a villa in Amshit. So this kind of thing will continue possibly with people who have money and are doing something personal. But any, I think any commercial venture, any business um, will not build their project today in Lebanon. It's going to have to wait. Yes, this is... Uh, they can't make money. <laughs> this is really sad. Um, do we have any other uh, questions from the audience? Thank you so much. Um, good evening. Uh, I'm Marcel, um, AIS USAC president. I wanted to ask you a few questions related to the construction technique that uh, you recently explained. So uh, technically you're heading towards uh, reflecting the construction process and techniques in the general aspect of the building, as well as the anthropological changes we are having uh, currently in Lebanon. My question is, uh, do you believe that the crisis in Lebanon on the long term uh, can create a sort of a new Lebanese uh, building typology? Thank you. Uh, Marcel, right? Yeah. Marcel, you, you said the, the last thing you said. Yes, I was asking that, uh, do you believe that the crisis in Lebanon on the long term uh, can create a sort of a new Lebanese building typology? because recently you were explaining okay. that uh, because of the low budget, the new anthropological changes yes. and everything. Yes, I, I, I do agree that things are going to have to change. I mean, obviously, we have to adapt. There's going to be, I don't know, some people are predicting up to 18 years before we're back to where we're supposed to be, which is scary. Uh, some people are saying it's going to be much shorter and things are going to get better. So, you know, I don't believe in future prediction, but... I think, I do look at the silver lining and the, the positive aspect of this. We are going to have to design more sustainably. We are going to have to design more economically. You know, we got to think about these things. Lebanon and property in Lebanon used to cost more than or as much as in London or New York, which is outrageous and ridiculous. So things are going back to normal. Now this, uh, I mean, to more logical levels. So the kind of money that's going to be spent on real estate will be less than it used to be. And as such, we have to adapt and adjust, I think. Uh, but we have to do it intelligently and we have to use sustainable techniques because that, that should happen anyway for, with every project that we do. But now I think it's accelerating. It's going to force everybody to do this. And that's a good thing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so do we have any other questions? Okay. Hello, it's Rodolf. Uh, I'm a civil engineer. Uh, I have a question concerning the steel rebar building. Uh, this building, uh, how it is founded on the ground? Yani? How did you... Uh, Which, the steel rebar building that was uh, mentioned in your projects... Uh, Oh, the, the church, church, the church. Yes. So, uh, you found uh, it by epoxy uh, or? Uh, uh, yeah, we, we, we were, uh, what we're planning is, I mean, we did sample walls, so we, we know how to build it. The, the layer is actually two layers of steel rather than one layer so that uh, structurally it'll hold, although, you know, rain, wind goes right through it. So there's not much to worry about in terms of loads, but uh, the foundations were meant to be simply, um, little pile found foundations, uh, the steel goes down, or we even discussed a, a simple little, uh, um, how should I say, linear uh, footing that is across the four by six um, uh, space. But uh, it's pretty simple. I mean, the load is, is almost nothing, right? So but My concern was the wind and the seismic loads. But again, steel, how it can, snack, it can stand, yeah. First of all, it, it being steel, it can move, right? It's flexible, and if there's a seismic, if there's a, an earthquake, there isn't much to worry about. And since there's no load, I mean, it's open. There's no glass. There's nothing. Air passes right through it. It, it according to the structural engineers, it's not an issue. So, I guess they ran some calculations. Actually, but the bars. <laughs> just 
<laughs> just recycle some rebar, pick it up from a, another washi, you know, put it in there, another another project, and that's it. Save some money. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, any more questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Madad. You.